So if we're talking about population, and we say that the wealthiest few comprise 1% of the population, the middle class comprises 95% of the population, and the lowest class comprises, let's say, 4 to 5 or so percent of the population, which is a collective of 100% of the population, and we recognize that we have a representational democracy, so that the more numbers you have, the more representational votes you have. Well, what ends up happening is that this group has the most representational power, right? This group has um, a lesser, this group, the lowest class, has a lesser representational power. Remember, Gassette, in one of the first, I think it was the first page, let me, uh, on the first page, I think, let me just make sure, he says, he says, um, this fact is the uh, ascension of the masses to complete social power, right? It's, it's social power. There is social power in the masses, right? So, if we're talking about social power and we recognize that the masses have social power, well, obviously, the more, the, the, the more, the larger the masses are, the more social power they have. How do we understand social power? Social power is expressed in representational vote count, right? Um, so that if this is a representation of the population, and this is a hypothetical, then the most representational power, as far as votes go, is in the masses. A lesser representation, representational power is in the lowest class, uh, the poorest people. But the least, surprisingly enough, the least, L-E-A-S-T, the least representational power, the least ability to influence um, government is from the wealthiest people in the nation, right? In, and this doesn't have to be the United States, this would apply anywhere, in any country, right? The masses comprise the majority of the population. The majority of the population generate the majority of the wealth. That wealth, the profit, is then channeled to the richest 1% of the population and diverted away from the lowest um, uh, one, you know, uh, fourth to fifth percent of the population, the poorest people in the population. However, as far as a vote goes, as far as sort of um, the ability to um, have institutional representation in representative, uh, representative democracy, the masses have the largest segment, the most power. They are the most powerful because they have more votes than obviously both the, the, the least and the highest in the class system combined, like tenfold, right? Like twentyfold, almost twentyfold, actually almost twentyfold. Five times twenty is a hundred, so almost twentyfold power, representational power, almost twentyfold representational power the masses have as far as a one-to-one -one vote um, in uh, influencing, the ability to influence the uh, sort of institutional foundation of a representat uh, representative democracy, which is huge, right? And I feel like the, the discussion's a bit, a bit technical tonight, and I apologize if it's a little too heady. But the point being, in, in, the, in the simplest terms, is that where there are numbers, there is power. Where there are numbers, you have a one-to-one -one vote. Everyone, whether you're rich, poor, or middle class, gets one vote. The majority of the population is comprised of the middle class. They have the majority of votes. That vote carries the greatest weight in determining the structure of our government, or any government for that matter. However, those with the most amount of money, unfortunately for them, have the least amount of influence, representational influence, because their numbers are so small. So the question then becomes, how is it that those with the most amount of money 
but the least amount of influence are able to affect those with average money, but the most amount of influence to give their influence to the wealthy. How do you influence the middle class? That's the million dollar question. Right? That's, the million, that's the billion, that's a trillion dollar, that's a trillion dollar question. Right? The attempt to figure out how to influence the middle class to serve the needs of the highest 1% is the trillion dollar question. It isn't so much just the mere sort of you know, banal discussion on capitalism and the fact that people can be exploited and their labor and profits go to the highest 1%. That's to disregard the fact that there is power in the middle class and Gassette talks about this power, right? He talks about the power of the middle class in the, his discussion on the revolt of the masses, right? Um, and what I'm going to do in the following discussions is to look at how Gassette addresses the power of the middle class, how he reconciles this distinction between the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class, and how we make sense of this average existence, which is the existence of the middle class, right? Does that average existence fluctuate? Well, obviously it does. Does that average existence, um, can that average existence expand or, or diminish? Obviously it can. What are the implications of an expanding middle class? How does that look economically? How does that look socially? What are the implications of a receding middle class? How does that look economically? How does that look socially? And what um, Gassette does in his discussion on the revolt of the masses is he attempts to analyze precisely um, this concept. And uh, I would encourage you to, uh, it's going to take me a while, and I'm going to um, dedicate the next few lectures, I don't know how long it'll take me, maybe two weeks or so, to do the lecture on Gassette. That's provided I, I do a video blog every day. It might take me as much as three weeks to a month to finish this discussion, but I want to just spend um, one entire uh, sort of theoretical in-depth analysis on one author, on one concept, um, and that will give you the opportunity to uh, go out and purchase purchase Gassette's book, right? So go out, purchase the book, Revolt of the Masses, uh, by Jose Ortega y Gasset. Go out and purchase that book, and that's the guy who wrote it. And and then read along. And if you have questions, ask questions. If you have things that you want me to address that he said or points of clarification, ask those questions, and I'll try to incorporate um, some analysis and address some of your concerns. And then we'll see how he addresses this concept of the middle classes and what exactly he means by this revolt, right? What does he mean by a revolt of the middle classes? And how does this revolt come about? How is this revolt prevented? How is this revolt um, uh, stabilized? And so on. So uh, with that, I'm going to end. Um, that was only analysis of chapter 1. In the next 14 uh, discussions, we'll be going through chapters 2 and 14 of Gasset's book. Um, I appreciate you taking the time watching uh, this video on Gassette's Revolt of the Masses. Uh, tune in next time and we'll pick up with chapter 2. Thank you. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.